My name is Brooke Edmonds. I'm with OSU Extension in Lennon Benton County. And you are in the OSU Extension Master Gardener Advanced Training webinar. So welcome to Master Gardeners and everybody else that's interested in this topic. So today's a special webinar in the series. Um, so we started something new called a uh, First Look, and it invites OSU graduate students to share their research projects and some of their results with Master Gardeners. So it's a little bit different than what we've normally been doing where it's been sort of this complete package. Today you're gonna get a little slice of a pie of some interesting um, results. So today we're joined by Aaron Anderson, and he's a graduate student with Dr. Gail Langolato in the OSU Department of Horticulture. And he's gonna be sharing his research into gardening with native plants that are attractive, but that also support pollinator populations. So let's just give him a second right now. We'll let him uh, share his screen and unmute and take it away. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Brooke. And uh, thank you all of you for uh, tuning in to listen to me uh, share some of my research and some preliminary results with you. I'm really excited and honored to be here. So uh, as Brooke said, I'm a graduate student in the horticulture department here at uh, Oregon State University. And um, I work uh, for Dr. Gail Langolato in the garden ecology lab. Uh, so we do a lot of really neat research in garden ecosystems. So uh, our lab URL is right there in the title of the slide, if you want to write that down and uh, stay tuned for, for uh, our current research and updates. Um, uh, I'm studying native plant pollinator interactions. Uh, Gail's doing a, uh, a really in-depth survey of uh, native bee populations in uh, urban gardens in Portland, and then Michael Nelson, who was one of my co-graduate students who just graduated this spring, uh, did a, a really interesting, interesting study characterizing uh, urban garden soils in, in, uh, in Portland. So uh, yeah, stay tuned to our uh, lab website there. Uh, so a quick uh, introduction to my own interest. So I'm really interest in, interested in restoring ecological function, especially in areas that have been uh, influenced by humans, uh, so urban areas, suburban areas, and uh, agricultural areas. Um, and I'm in particular really interested in, in insects and pollinators, uh, natural enemies, so parasitoids and uh, predators that might control pests, uh, and sensitive species like threatened and endangered species. Okay, so to kind of set the stage for, for my study, uh, I, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's uh, currently been a global decline in uh, many pollinator species, uh, notably in bee species in particular. Uh, and one of the things that a lot of uh, conservationists and land managers uh, do to try to help these uh, imperiled species are uh, targeted plantings of, of flowers, essentially, because these are the resources that bees need. Uh, and uh, urban landscapes are actually really uniquely positioned to kind of help uh, some of these species that are, are declining. Uh, so I have a photo there of a native bee on goldenrod, one of my uh, research plants, and then also uh, Clarkia, um, a bumblebee is really kind of burrowing in there. Uh, so what do we know about gardens and pollinators? As I mentioned, uh, our lab does a lot of work in garden ecosystems, uh, and there have been multiple studies that have shown that urban areas can actually have a higher bee diversity than the surrounding landscape, uh, which might seem surprising since normally you think of urbanization as something that makes uh, the, the, the population of native uh, insects and animals decrease. But what urban areas have are gardens and, and places that we've planted with a lot of flowering resources uh, for bees because we like seeing flowers in our yards and in our parks. And uh, these flowers provide good habitat for, for bee populations. Uh, we also like to plant flowers all season long. We don't just have tulips in the spring. Um, we have you know, a whole suite of different plants that, that bloom for, from spring until fall. And this provides great food for, for bees the entire flight season. And there's also been studies that suggest that uh, these urban areas actually have a lower uh, amount of pesticides than agricultural areas, uh, which, which makes sense when you think of how a lot of conventional agriculture uh, relies heavily on insecticides. So uh, if, especially I think if a, if a urban area is surrounded by uh, a lot of ag land, uh, urban areas can actually kind of serve as a, as a refuge. Uh, and 
there's also a lot of nesting sites for, for cavity nesting bees. Uh, urban areas are full of kind of nooks and crannies and places that, that bees can, can uh, make nests. Uh, so urban gardens really do have a high conservation potential for pollinators, uh, which is, I think, something that's really exciting. So with this decline in, in a lot of different bee species, uh, and I think a really, really amazing uh, uh, amount of interest by the public in, in the plight of, of bees, um, you can find a lot of different suggested planting lists for pollinators. Uh, you can find things from you know, local garden organizations, nonprofits, uh, governmental organizations, which is really great. But unfortunately, a lot of these lists aren't based on empirical research, or they're kind of more observation based. Uh, and in fact, there was a 2014 paper uh, that compared a number of these suggested pollinator planting lists and found that there was actually very little overlap between uh, the plant species that were listed on them, uh, even among lists that were designed uh, for the same geographic region. Uh, so that, is you know an issue and it's the case here in the pacific northwest uh, to my knowledge there's no evidence-based pollinator planting lists uh, for for our region here and actually that's really the case for most of the united states there was a great study done uh, in at michigan state university that looked at uh, upper midwest prairie species but uh, other than that there there hasn't been a lot of uh, comparative research done on the attractiveness of, of native plants to to bees uh, and I do want to stress that observations are really important. Uh, this gives us a great foundation to, to explore uh, and can provide a lot of really useful information. But especially for our lab, when we're making recommendations to the public about the top plants to plant to uh, attract pollinators, we want to make sure that we have uh, you know, scientific underpinnings for our recommendations. So that leads me to, to, to my study. So with this knowledge gap, I'm interested in, in three big questions. One, which of our native Willamette Valley wildflowers are the most attractive to pollinators? So that's the pollinator abundance. Uh, which plants attract the most pollinators? Uh, pollinator species, sorry. So that's diversity. And then also, which plants attract the most gardeners? Because we are really interested in not just plants that will attract pollinators, but plants that gardeners will actually want to plant and people will want to, to see in their yards and in parks. So that brings me to, uh, you know, the beginning of my study was, was trying to determine which plants to study. So I'm really interested in plants that can thrive with uh, little attention, so little water and nutrients, uh, because there's uh, I think a broader suite of applications for them. Not only can they be used in home gardens, but they can be planted in places like roadsides and uh, parks that receive little maintenance. Um, I think there's really uh, a whole, a whole, you know, world of applications for for places that you could plant these plants. So I wanted plants that were drought tolerant, uh, able to grow in full sun, uh, and have some documented use. And again, this is often anecdotal uh, by pollinators. And uh, I want them to be potentially attractive to gardeners and to landscape designers so that they would actually be used. So a member of our lab is a, a landscape designer, so she kind of vetted my list to make sure that uh, they were at least, you know, somewhat attractive to, to, to home gardeners. And there's an example. I have Yara, which is a, a great drought-tolerant native. So this is my complete list. Uh, I won't read all of these, but um, the, the main take home message on this slide is that I have uh, 10 annual species, uh, 13 perennial species, and those are the ones highlighted in blue in that table. And then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see I have four uh, species in orange, and those are uh, non-native garden species that are known to be attractive to pollinators. Uh, and you are probably familiar with most of them. We have oregano, catnip, sage, and uh, lavender. So I'll give it maybe a second more on this slide just to make sure everybody can, can see, and then uh, I'll move forward. Okay. So I have all of my plants installed uh, in this large field study. I have about three acres uh, in Aurora, Oregon, which is, if you're familiar with Oregon, is just a little bit south of Portland. 
uh, and I have all of my plants installed in one meter squared plots that are separated by six meters. I have five replicates of each species, so um, plus a control block, so it's a total of 140 individual one meter squared plots. Uh, and in between each plot, uh, or the, all of the plots, I should say, I have perennial ryegrass planted to kind of ensure a constant buffer zone. So in that image there on the right, you can see uh, a section of my field, and I've tried to outline plots in, in red uh, so you can see them, uh, and you can see the spacing in the, in the ryegrass in between. So it's a very pretty place to, to do a lot of work in the summer. So uh, what I do with my study to, to get at that first point I, know, I, I, I uh, remarked about abundance. Uh, so the week before, the week during, and the week after peak bloom for each individual plot, um, I sit with my coworker Lucas for uh, a timed five minutes and we count all of the insects that land on open flowers. Uh, so we'll, you know, if obviously we're interested in bees and, and surfid flies and wasps, but if a beetle walks across, we'll record that. Um, any, any insect that's uh, visiting a flower. Um, because it's quite difficult actually to identify bees as they're flying, um, we have five uh, morphotypes, or just kind of broad categories that we lump the bees into. Uh, we have bumblebee, small bee, big bee, green bee, and honey bee. And I have examples of all of those uh, on the right there that, that we took in the, in the lab with our camera. And I have green bee twice, just because they're so pretty. I thought I'd throw in a couple of them. Uh, and we do our sampling when the weather's favorable for pollinator flight, so it has to be warm enough, there has to be enough sunlight, uh, and uh, a, a, a low enough wind speed. So then uh, to get at that next question, the pollinator diversity, so how many individual species are visiting a certain flower, uh, we have to actually catch the, the individual bees and take them back to the lab where we can uh, identify them um, um, under, under a scope. Um, so to do that, I use a bee vacuum or an insect vacuum. So it's actually in both photos there, but it's that kind of Ghostbusters looking thing uh, that is a, it's a modified leaf blower with this attachment that sucks bees up and spits them out into a bag. Uh, and what's really exciting about using this is it's able to suck up everything that you uh, have underneath it. So that includes not just the bees and the serpent flies, but all the insects present on the flower. So uh, beetles, spiders, uh, pests like aphids and thrips, uh, and then what I'm really excited about, natural enemies, uh, the predators like, like lady beetles and uh, parasitoid wasps and flies. So uh, I do four vacuum passes of each plot, uh, and then we pour all of those samples into ethanol and bag them up and put them into the freezer for, for uh, sorting and identification later in the season. Uh, and then we also measure the bloom phenology. So the phenology is the kind of timing of the, the life cycle of the plant. So we record the peak bloom dates and the bloom duration for each species. So when it first flowers and when it stops flowering. Um, and the reason for this is to uh, allow gardeners on, on a list that we'll provide, you know, a top pollinator planting lists. Uh, we want to also include flowering time so that gardeners can plant species that have an overlapping bloom because it's one of the really important factors when you're providing uh, habitat for bees is to have flowers that are blooming uh, constantly throughout the uh, uh, flight season so that bees always have uh, a source of, of pollen and nectar. I mean, there's an example pot in bloom, uh, that's yarrow again. All right, so now um, I'm here for some preliminary results. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions thus far, Brooke, that I should address or if I should uh, wait till the end. I think we can wait till the end. There's some general questions. So. Okay, that yeah. sounds perfect, thank you. Great, so uh, the first question is which plants attract the most pollinators, so abundance. And here's Lucas and I working on uh, one of the plots and then some bumblebees on a uh, Gilia capitata flower. So on this slide, I have the uh, 2017, so I've been, I should have mentioned, I've been doing this study for two years so far, 2017 uh, and 2018. 
so this is the mean bee abundance by plant species. So on this graph, you'll see on the x-axis, I have the plant species. Uh, and then the mean abundance is on the y-axis. So this is per five minute observation um, on average for each of these plots, how many bees uh, we recorded. And I've uh, highlighted the exotic garden species in with little red asterisks. Uh, you can see the catnip and the oregano and the salvia. Um, lavender didn't bloom this year. Uh, so it's not on the list. Uh, you might notice there's actually a number of other plants that didn't bloom that first year. So um, that's why if you if you notice there's fewer than uh, 27 flower species on the on the x-axis. That's the reason for that. And then I have uh, Native bee other native bees highlighted in orange bumblebees are the blue uh, Green bees are green and then honeybees are the yellow color on the bar graph. So Madia elegans and Gilea capitata were the two most attractive species in 2017, and those are both uh, native annual species. Uh, and then we had Aster and Solidago as the next two most attractive species, and those are both uh, native perennials. And I think it's noteworthy that all four of those species were more attractive than uh, our non-native garden species known to be attractive to, to pollinators, both catnip and, and oregano. So I'll move forward to 2018. So I have the same type of graph here. I have the mean bee abundance per five minutes for each of these plots on the y-axis and then the plant species on the x-axis. Uh, and you can see right away that we have a, a, a very different looking top five. Um, oregano and Gilea capitata were the two most attractive species, uh, and followed by lavender, California poppy, and catnip. Uh, so three of those non-native garden species uh, jumped into the top five. Uh, though if you'll look closely at the, at the graph, you can see there's a lot of yellow. So these uh, popular flowers are really being driven strongly by honeybee visitation. And then I think something that's, that's interesting and encouraging for native plants is that if you look at the, the next suite of plants kind of right after that top five, we have a lot of native species that were you know, pretty attractive to bees but they were pretty, they were attractive mainly to native bees. So you can see Facelia and Aster and Goldenrod, Solidago there, uh, have a lot of other native bees and bumblebees visiting them. So I, was, I started getting interested in when I made these graphs uh, into that relationship. So I thought I would look at the bee abundance again for 2017 and 2018, but ignoring honeybees. So looking at uh, this other segment of, of, of of bees, the native bees that um, are really important and really diverse. What plants uh, affect those the most? So in 2017, um, the results are similar to the, uh, the results with honeybees, except for catnip drops out of the top five and California poppy jumps into the top five. But you can see that Gilea capitata, uh, Madia, Aster, uh, were all really attractive to, to our uh, native bees move on to 2018. I'll actually give a second just to, you can kind of see then a lot of these same species at the end um, weren't very attractive. So the Western Red Columbine, the um, Oregon Sunshine, Lupin. Uh, 2018 um, had a lot of changes when you took out honeybees. Um, so California poppy, uh, aster, Facelia and goldenrod were, were the top four with Clarkia, uh, Farewell to Spring, the fifth most attractive plant. Uh, and those three non-native uh, garden species, uh, oregano, catnip, and, and lavender, all dropped out of the top five. Uh, so I think this is a really interesting result, uh, looking at the kind of the difference in attractiveness of various species to honeybees versus uh, all of our native bees. And you can see some interesting patterns too that both Facelia and then Lavender were both highly attractive to bumblebees in particular. So it'll be interesting as I analyze my data further, looking at um, you know, different groups of the native bees themselves and seeing which species um, might be more attracted to certain wildflowers. So there were obviously different results between 2017 and 2018. Um, and you know, you might be wondering why, and you know, that's something I wonder as well. So we have 
multiple different uh, hypotheses that that they could all contribute, or it could be something different, in potent, you know, potentially. Um, but in 2017, this is the year we established our plots and we planted and seeded all of the plants. Um, and it was a really wet spring, so they weren't able to work the the farm field um, and till it. Uh, because the, the ground was pretty much just a mud bog, unfortunately. Uh, so we weren't able to get our plants into the ground until about the end of April, which um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. That's very late for, for planting uh, some native plants. Uh, versus 2018, the plants had already been in the ground for an entire growing season. Uh, and because of that late spring, or uh, the wet spring, I should say, and the delayed planting, some of our uh, early flowering species like uh, camas and columbine uh, and and iris they all flowered in the greenhouse unfortunately and we didn't get any data for them uh, in 2017 the perennials were also quite young they didn't have as robust uh, floral di displays and um, were just smaller in general uh, but after a year in the ground in 2018 uh, they were really filling in the plots a lot better and had a much larger floral display um, which you know you could hypothesize would you know change the attractiveness of these plants uh, to pollinators. In 2017, because we wanted uh, these these flowers to all establish, of course, we irrigated the plots. Um, but in 2018, we didn't irrigate them because we wanted to see how they would do uh, in our in our climate here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, so, on top of that, it was a much drier year as well this year. Um, Last year, there was almost three inches of rain across the four months of May, June, July, and August. But this year, uh, there was just under nine tenths of an inch of rain total across um, those same four months. Uh, and I think that had a big impact on uh, the flower timing as well as the bloom duration of a lot of these plants. The things just were really dry and the plants dried out quickly. Um, so this is uh, one of the reasons why for these types of study, it's studies, it's really important to do uh, multiple years to kind of account for this temporal var variation in, in rainfall and, um, you know, biological systems are complex. So there's a lot um, that, that can change from year to year. So the more years you can do a study, um, I think the more sound your data will be. Okay, so next, I want to touch on uh, which plants attracted the most pollinator species, so the diversity. So here's uh, two photos of the insect vacuum in use. So overall diversity. Uh, so far across 2017 and 2018, we collected 36 uh, different bee species uh, and a total of 540 total bees. So you might ask whether that's a lot, and we don't really know because uh, we don't know how many bee species you know are are in that uh, agricultural field to begin with. Um, you know, there's I think around 500 bee species found in Oregon, but obviously only a small subset of those would be found uh, in the region where my my study is. And since it's being performed in an agricultural area, uh, lots of times people think of ag areas as kind of um, pollinator filters that filter out a lot of the specialist species because there's not a lot of floral diversity blooming in farm fields. Uh, so you find more generalist species to begin with there. Um, but, you know, we found those 36 bee species, which I'm excited about, and we found uh, some Bombus calignosus individuals, um, all on lavender, which is a vulnerable species on the IUCN red list. Uh, and we also found Bombus fervidus, which is a bumblebee that's also on the IUCN red list. Uh, and we found that on lavender, the salvia, and the gilia. And here's uh, photos of those two bees. Okay, so this is a little bit of a, a complicated graph or a figure, but um, I thought it was a good way to visualize, the, visualize this diversity and abundance uh, uh, information. So this is just for bumblebees, and this is based off the vacuum samples that I took with the insect vacuum. Uh, and you'll see on the y-axis we have the plant species names and on the x-axis we have uh, the bumblebee names and you know if you go up the the graph you'll see you know there's a square where each bumblebee and plant species meet and then that's colored in uh, darker or lighter depending on uh, how often we collected that species off or that 
species off of that plant species. So darker squares represent a higher pollinator abundance. And then a white square means we didn't collect any of those bees on that plant at all. And you can see just looking at bumblebees, um, the plant that's, uh, that attracted the highest uh, number as well as the greatest diversity of species uh, was Phacelia. Um, and then Gilea capitata and lavender, both were also um, quite popular with bumblebees in general, and uh, we collected more bumblebee species off those plants. Um, you can see that all of the bumblebee visitation was really driven strongly by that first bumblebee, which is the yellow-faced bumblebee, uh, which is probably the bumblebee you're gonna see like 90% of the time here in the Willamette Valley, so that wasn't too surprising uh, to us. Okay, so now that I, primed you with that first uh, graph. Here's a larger one of the other native bees. So this isn't taking into account uh, honeybees, uh, but again, it's the same setup. On the y-axis, we have the plant species, and on the x-axis, we have the bee species. Uh, and then again, the darker squares represent higher abundance. So the big take home from this, uh, this image is that Douglas Aster, um, Goldenrod, and Pearly Everlasting, those are the top three there, the Aster Toledago, and um, they're all very popular with a variety of bee species. You can see uh, a whole number of different um, squares up as you run across the graph um, are, are shaded different, different darknesses. Um, and you can see that some of those uh, exotic garden species, the catnip, oregano, lavender, um, those kind of fall into the second half. They were attracting a lot of bees overall, but they weren't attracting a lot of native bees. So I will move on here. So to get back at that overall question of which plants attract the most pollinators, uh, the answer kind of is, it depends. Um, are you counting honeybees? Are you looking at just bumblebees? Um, as I noted earlier, in 2018, only two of the original top five plants were attractive to both honeybees and natives. Um, and then, because you, you know, as I mentioned, there was a lot of variability between our 2017 and 2018 data, um, it highlights the, the, how much of an impact that the conditions can have. Um, and also, are your plants new? Are they established? Um, how, how is their floral bloom changing from year to year? So there's a lot of factors at play that can uh, influence the attractiveness of, of wildflowers to, to pollinators. And here's that, I think I used that photo already, but I really love it, the uh, yellow-faced bumblebee really sticking its face in that Clarkia. Yeah. So I thought I'd make, I have two tables here, again, just looking at the top five, uh, so you can kind of see them spelled out. Um, uh, this is the data based off of my observation data. So when I sat for five minutes and counted pollinators and sorted them into those five broad groups um, of uh, 2017 visits and 2018 visits uh, for all bees, including honeybees. So you can see um, there was, only Gilea and Nepeta both were top five plants in 2017 and also in uh, 2018. But those were the top five plants for both of those two years. Okay, I'll move on. And then here I have the um, native bees. So these are the, the top is 2017 and 2018, um, those observation data again, but just taking out honeybees from, from the data set. Um, and you can see uh, a little bit of change. We still have Gilea um, in 2017, but Gilea actually drops out in 2018 because it was being visited by a lot of honeybees. We have California poppy, Douglas aster, uh, Basilia, goldenrod, and Clarkia. And then I also threw in the top five from those vacuum samples. Um, so looking at the, the number of bees we collected um, when we were actually doing sampling events. And it's interesting that you know, this is a little bit different than the observation data, which you can expect because when we were sampling with the vacuum sample, we were only getting the bees that were there on that flower when we passed the vacuum over it. As opposed to over five minutes, there can be a lot more bees coming and going. Um, so it's kind of a little bit more of a snapshot. But you can see there's still a lot of overlap in 2017. Gilea capitata, um, Douglas aster, Madia, um, 
those were all top five plants also in our observations for native bees. Uh, but then also Clerkia and Italian oregano jumped in there. Uh, in 2018, again, there was a lot of overlap, um, but lavender made, it, made an appearance as well, which makes sense because it had a lot of bumblebee visitation, I think, making it jump into that top five. So next steps. Um, so currently in the lab, I'm trying to go through those vacuum sample uh, bags full of, of all the other insects, because you might notice that I mentioned parasitoids and predators and pests early on, but I hadn't shared any data about those. So I'm trying to pull all of those insects out um, to see which of them are associated with various plants. Um, and I think this is going to be really inf interesting information to share with, with gardeners and people who want to plant these plants because uh, it'll give a kind of a complete picture of the insect communities associated with them. So if we're recommending a, plant, uh, a gardener plant a certain plant to attract pollinators, uh, it's also important to share um, you know, whether this plant will attract garden pests um, or on, on a more positive note, whether we find lots of, of parasitoid wasps on it that can control uh, other garden pests. So I think this is going to be really interesting information. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer uh, to, to go through these under the dissecting scope. So this is kind of what it looks like. Here's an image of a couple of wasps uh, under the dissecting scope. So some of these, these sample bags are uh, full of, of all sorts of um, insects and um, things to sort through. And then we're also going to have a 2019 field season, which I'm really excited about. Um, a, because I love going out and, and sampling my plots, but then also because I mentioned, you know, we saw this, this variation between 2017 and 2018, and having another field season will kind of help account for that temporal variation more. Um, and I mentioned each year we kind of had species that didn't flower for various reasons, uh, so this will help us gather data for those flowers. Um, and we're also interested in irrigating half the plots and not irrigating half the plots uh, to kind of get at that, that question that I was wondering about how does, does water use impact um, the bloom duration and the, the amount of bloom that these plants have, but then also um, how attractive they are to the pollinators. Because I think that some gardeners might be, you know, really into xeriscaping and no water use. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how, how plants with no supplemental water do. But then I think realistically, a lot of gardeners, you know, will water even, even a, a, you know, kind of a drought tolerant type, type garden, uh, occasionally at least. Um, and I think that will change both, both the aesthetics and also uh, the phenology of these plants and how they interact with the, the bee species that we find. So I think that'll be a really neat thing to investigate uh, this upcoming summer. Take a drink of water here. Okay, so then the third component of this, uh, which plants attract the most gardeners? Uh, so as I mentioned, we're not just interested in the most attractive flowers, we also want flowers that gardeners will find attractive and actually want to plant. So we're getting at this by doing a, a survey um, that's available online. And it's, it's, it's pretty simple, it's just you know, images of these flowers. And then on a Likert scale, so just a one to five scale, um, people, uh, rate how attractive they find those species, and then also how likely they would be to plant them in their home garden. So we have some um, some responses so far, um, and this is a quick summary of the aesthetics question. Uh, so how aesthetically pleasing uh, gardeners find uh, my species? Uh, so on the y-axis, we have the Likert score, so that's just that zero to five uh, rating, and then the plant species is on the, the x-axis. Uh, so on the right hand side of the screen, bordered in red, are the most attractive plants. So you can see that um, a lot of the most attractive plants to gardeners, unfortunately, weren't very attractive to pollinators. So this is the blue-eyed grass, or uh, one of our native camas species, uh, iris tenax, or tough-leaf iris, uh, and then western red columbine was the most attractive. Uh, so out of those top five, only Gilea capitata was also uh, on one of the top five lists for, for pollinators. Um, and you can see I, I highlighted in orange the uh, plants that were attractive to pollinators in the top five lists. Um, and you can see a lot of those are actually clustered closer to the end. But I think on the plus side, a lot of uh, my species are, you know, score around four. Um, 
you know, that whole middle range there, which, you know, I think on a out of five scale, you know, four is, is doing pretty well. But a lot of these really attractive ones like Facelia um, rate pretty lowly, unfortunately. So um, because of that, that kind of brings a question of like, how do we bridge the divide between um, gardeners perceived attractiveness to some of these plants and pollinators attractiveness? So there have been a couple studies done looking at um, the, the you know what limits the use of native plants by home gardeners and the top three um, issues were the availability of these plants a lot of them just aren't available uh, customer preferences so you know what you perceive as, as beautiful and attractive um, and then also just a lack of knowledge about natives a lot of people aren't familiar with them um, and if they are familiar with them they might only be familiar with a small subset of the the you know huge plethora of native plants that that are out there um, so then there's some potential solutions for this. So one is just that marketing and exposure um, can help shape consumer preferences. Uh, and what both of these studies kind of suggest is that uh, availability um, will, if more plants are available, then more people will see them and become interested in them and there'll kind of be a positive feedback loop. Um, so I think kind of trying to expose people to these plants, um, having more gardeners plant them and sharing them with their neighbors um, will kind of increase uh, demand and also uh, perceived attractiveness. Um, and I also want to stress that I'm in no way saying that, you know, you should only garden with natives. Uh, I love showy ornamental garden species too. They're really attractive. Uh, and one thing that I think a lot of people do and recommend is to plant natives among the ornamental species in your garden so that you can kind of have the best of both worlds. You can provide a lot of ecological value to our native, um, you know, insects, birds, uh, but then also have the, the showy displays that you, that you love. Um, so I guess to kind of summarize, what should I plant to conserve pollinators? Um, as I, note, I noted in my talk so far, some plants attract a lot of individuals, but not very many species. And then on the other hand, some plants attract a lot of species, but not as many overall bees. Um, and flowering can, can vary due to, you know, when you planted the plants and how often you water them. And then something I didn't touch on, but there can also be a lot of seasonal changes in bee populations. And you might find one bee species visiting one flower one year and a, and a different flower the next. Um, but overall, one thing you can really do is, is plant a diverse set of native plants because a lot of our native pollinators, some of them are specialists, so they require a certain you know, genus, for example, and a lot of them are generalists and they can all, you know, they can feed on a variety of different plants. Um, but to kind of buffer for that, you know, bee preference as well as kind of temporal variation due to, um, you know, seasonality, having a variety of native plants um, can kind of help um, yeah, buffer that. But then for Pacific Northwest gardeners in particular, um, just kind of recapping those top five lists again, um, you, you know, you can't go wrong planting Gilea capitata, Ormadia, Aster, um, Goldenrod. Those were all just really popular, not just with bees, but, you know, anecdotally just being out there sampling all sorts of other insects. They were kind of like insect truck stops. Um, there were just so many coming and going. Um, you know, in 2018, we had a lot of those uh, non-native garden species, but again, um, Gilea capitata was great. And, you know, there were so many bees visiting lavender and, and catnip, for example. Um, and then California poppy, it's a really beautiful plant um, and uh, easy to grow. And it attracts a lot of native bees um, and not very many um, honeybees, which is interesting, but I think that might be because it doesn't uh, produce nectar. And then this is the top five aesthetic list um, and you can see it's kind of a different suite of, of natives but they're all beautiful and then Gilea capitata was was one that uh, was attractive to to pollinators and um, also uh, really aesthetically pretty to the gardeners who took the survey um, so how can you promote native plants um, so the one thing I would suggest is just try something new so a lot of our natives uh, take a few years to establish and really become um, their full beautiful selves. Uh, so they don't look as attractive when they're on the shelf compared to some of the more showy uh, ornamental species. So give some native plants a chance. Uh, buy some that you know will provide a nice ecological benefit. Um, plant them and give them a few years and, and I think you might be really pleasantly surprised. Uh, something else is, is to consider ecological beauty in addition to just aesthetic beauty. Um, a lot of native plants 
do attract you know our our native uh uh, insect and bird communities. Uh, obviously, I didn't really touch on it, but there's a lot of um, native plants that are caterpillar host plants that our native butterflies need to, to feed on in order to, to uh, survive. So by planting things like milkweed for monarchs, you can uh, really increase the, the uh, ecological uh, beauty aspect of your garden. And then the other thing is just to tell a friend or a neighbor about native plants. I think a lot of us garden with the plants we're familiar with uh, that, you know, we might see neighbors gardening with, that maybe our parents gardened with, um, or that we just see uh, on the shelves at, at, at large garden stores. So I think exposing more people to natives and, and you know, telling a friend or, or a neighbor why you're gardening with a certain species or why you're excited about it can go a long way to kind of promoting this uh, this kind of niche of, of, of native plant gardening. And then there's a couple longhorn bees on Columbine. It's kind of a neat photo to end with. So with that, thank you so much for watching. Uh, you can follow along for updates on, on my research as well as uh, the other ongoing research in the Garden Ecology Lab at that URL there. I also have a personal little web bit page that I have photos and updates uh, in the middle there. And then if you have any other questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is a uh, link right there. Um, and yeah, with that, I would love to take any, any questions that you all have. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. And unfortunately, you can't hear us all clapping for you, but <laughs> there's a lot of clapping out there. Um, so I do want to just note to attendees that I have all of these links that Aaron's mentioned, and I'll be sending them out also with a link to the recording um, later on. So the link to the survey, it looks like it's still open, and to these um, different lab pages. So you'll get all of that. So don't worry if you don't catch them here. Um, and we do have some questions coming through. If we're not able to answer yours live in the time that we have, we'll, we'll look through and we can email you back directly. Um, so let me go through here. Um, so just a couple questions I think for you, Aaron, and this is not you know, your inquisition of your, <laughs> your defense or anything. These are just general friendly questions. Sure. Right? I know graduate students are always like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Um, just sort of just some questions on how long your study you, you plan to last. It sounds like you're adding a third year. Yeah. And then um, Sarah also wants to know about the maintenance that you do within those plots. Like, do you do any deadheading? Like, gardeners come through and, you know, sort of clean things up. So. Yeah. That's a good question. So, yeah. So, we're um, going to have three field seasons for, for, for the answer the duration question. Um, so, yeah, 2017, 18, and then um, this upcoming summer as well. And then, yeah. So, the unglamorous part of, of my, my project is that my, my coworker Lucas and I do a lot of maintenance of these plots. So we go up weekly to weed because we don't want any competing uh, flowering species, obviously, in the plots. They, you know, kind of confuse the results. Um, so we do lots of weeding in the plots. Um, we have to control the weeds in the, in the grass, which luckily this year um, was a lot easier because that grass grew in thicker and kind of kept things like thistle and wild radish down. Um, and then we also, yeah, during the, um, I left a lot of those, um, I guess the kind of dead parts of the, the plants that, that um, overwintered uh, up throughout the winter. Um, one of my advisors kind of recommended, uh, who, one of the guys on my committee, yeah, uh, Professor uh, Lloyd Knackley, he uh, said, you know, we don't really know, maybe there's, there's something that these native plants do that um, you know requires, or it's helpful to have these, you know, larger dead portions um, overwintering, whether it's insulation or or what, what, whatever it might be. But then in the following spring, before the new growth started, I you know cut that that material back. So um, yeah, so I cut back dead material, do lots of weeding every week. Um, yeah, so lots of lots of maintenance. Great, thank you. Um, so Skip would like to know if these different bee species, are they territorial? Like, are they competing with each other? Or is there maybe some like, you know, another layer of like interaction of like, get off of my flower, you know, sort of thing? Do you yeah, I think that is um, a really good question. Um, so I know that, you know, I'm not sure about the bee species that I've collected in particular, if, um, you know, they necessarily camp out and, and defend. That's something that I should, you know, look into a little bit more um, to kind of maybe explain some of the, the patterns. But I know that, that honeybees in particular can be really 
um, efficient foragers, um, and they can kind of outcompete a lot of the native species, especially because there's so many of them. You know, some of these oregano plants were just, you know, there were 25 honeybees on them and maybe one native bumblebee, and that was it. Um, and something that I found interesting was that Gilia capitata last year was being visited almost exclusively by bumblebees. And then this year, it seemed like the honeybees found them. And it was almost all honeybees with only like the occasional bumblebee that could kind of make its way in um, because the way um, you know it works is that the honeybees will locate a suitable patch of, of flowering resources and then kind of keep visiting that until it's it's exhausted um, and in doing that I think it really does outcompete um, and kind of push some of the native species out so I think that is a dynamic that can that can certainly be uh, at play um, I think with a lot of the native bees, just anecdotally from observing them, um, a lot of them I don't think were visiting in high enough quantities to really do that. Um, it was mostly the honeybees that I would be, I think, most um, concerned about that occurring with. Um, did you do any, I know you are collecting so many different species, did you do anything with um, butterflies at all? So Karen was wondering about a list yeah. of butterflies, and I know that's it's, a, yeah. That's a fantastic question, and that's something that I was, oh, I am really interested in, and I was, um, uh, you know, just as interested in going into this project, and I even planted, you might have noticed, uh, showy milkweed um, as, as a, it's both attractive to, to all sorts of pollinators, but it's also a, uh, you know, the monarch host plant. Um, but unfortunately, I just haven't seen very many butterflies uh, at my plots over the last two years. There's been maybe the occasional fritillaria and then a couple um, little skippers um, and cabbage white butterflies. But other than that, um, there just hasn't been a lot. So that's the reason I don't have any data on that and have, I didn't share any butterfly uh, attractiveness. But I would love to to, to have that data to share. Yeah, sometimes it's hard if you just don't have enough to, to really make a good conclusion then, yeah. Exactly. So we have a lot of questions. People would love to have this information. So could you share sort of the plan for publishing this and making it available? Because I mean, this is a great webinar, but you know, are you gonna be publishing in journals? Are you gonna publish an extension? What's, what's sort of the plan for this work? Yeah, so actually the answer is, is both. Um, so, you know, I plan, um, as, as I'm writing my thesis, to, to publish uh, 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 probably at least three different papers on attractiveness to pollinators, uh, then natural enemies, once I have all of that data, and then also attractiveness to, to, to gardeners. Um, and then I'll also um, be making this information available through extension documents as well. Um, so yeah, so I, I'll kind of that more formal academic route, but then also um, you know the extension route to share with with growers and gardeners um, and anybody who's interested in in planting these these plants. So yeah, we're hoping to come up with a ranked list of of um, you know the top pollinator plants uh, for for the Willamette Valley, uh, and you know I'll informally be publishing this both on on our lab's blog page as well as my own website, um, but. You know, nothing formal yet since, again, the 2019 data will, will only add to, to that knowledge base and maybe we'll change the results a little bit, so. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a couple listeners who are from outside of the Willamette Valley, so in, folks yeah. in Southern Oregon, but then also um, Marcella's in Ohio, right? And so do you know of places where the, you know, these folks can contact? I know, and it's really hard. I mean, you were saying, that these lists are, are incomplete. And so um, do you have any ideas of where they could check in to find local lists? That's a great question. So I think that, um, well, the first thing is I, I you know, I, I, a lot of the lists that are being produced, um, you know, have great information, I mean, even if it's not, maybe not complete or um, not maybe, you know, kind of an empirical ranked research, um, you know, basis. But um, I think looking at the Xerces Society's website, um, they have pollinator planting lists for, for each region of the United States um, is a good research resource. And then also, um, if anybody, I think at their, you know, maybe the local uh, land grant institution is, is doing research on, on native pollinators, they might have um, ideas there for more, for more local resources. So I'd, you know, maybe look into whether, you know, their, the extension um, programs, you know, in, in Ohio or um, Virginia, wherever they may be, um, are, are, you know, doing this type of research or looking at these relationships, I think that would be a good, a good resource. And then I'd also um, mention that 
a number of the plants that I'm, I'm studying are actually, you know, pretty ubiquitous across the United States. Um, so like goldenrod, pearly everlasting, yarrow, all of those you'll find in, in a variety of different places. So um, I think hopefully there will be some tidbits from my research that um, might be useful to gardeners uh, throughout the U.S. Great, thanks. And I think just a couple more like comments on those publications for the gardeners. People would love to see it like cross-referenced against deer browsing, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> One of our enemies. Um, and then maybe including something on bloom times might be yes. interesting to, like to get that year-long bloom. So um, I really look forward to seeing how this all comes together. It's going to Thanks, be. Yeah, and that is something that I'm. Um, I didn't stress enough. I don't think in in, in my talk, but I'm. I'm definitely planning on including that that bloom time um on the list as well so that gardeners can pick things that um will will have overlapping blooms so they can provide uh you know flowering resources for bees all season long great well there's a couple other questions but i think i'll just follow up with you um afterwards aaron on those to get those answered and i really appreciate everyone joining in and um, i really appreciate you giving a great presentation aaron we learned a lot um, our next webinar is coming up in November on the 19th, and it's the weird and wonderful world of plant galls. We're going to have Melanie Putnam, our diagnostician, talking about fungal, bacterial, insect galls, all those weird things you see when you're out in your garden and out walking in the woods. So look forward to that and also um, look forward to seeing the email with a recording and some of this information, these web links that Aaron shared. So thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you Thank taking you. the time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.